So you guys know, obviously, we got the results from the um, same-sex marriage plebiscite. So I just thought I would preach a sermon just encouraging us, you know, because obviously we've, we've realized now that, I mean, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's surprising, obviously, that we're in the minority, right, um, because of what's happened. But I wanted to preach today on just when the majority is wrong. Just go through a couple of examples in the Bible, um, just as an encouragement to us uh, to, to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Now, I, just, just reflecting on the results of the uh, same-sex marriage, um, it, it wasn't, and it wasn't actually a plebiscite. I don't know if you guys know, it was just a postal survey. Everyone was referring to it as a plebiscite, but it's not actually a plebiscite, because I believe a plebiscite is uh, compulsory. I do wonder, though, how many people voted yes, just to get the homos off their back. Because I know a lot of people did that, right? They just voted yes because they're just like, oh, I don't want to hear about this anymore. Just give them whatever just because they've been harking on for, for so long. I think a lot of people voted yes because they didn't realize the consequences. Maybe they didn't even realize who they were voting for. And then, you know, when the yes no vote was announced, I don't know if you guys know, but there was like this, uh, this party in Hyde Park and, and all the homos and stuff were just stripping off and just having some naked party there. Um, but these are the sort of people that are behind this and are, and are promoting this because that's what homosexuality is about. It's about fornication. It's about, um, you know, not, uh, you know, living pure and clean and, and living the way God intended. It's just satisfying and gratifying uh, people's sexual urges. So, you know, obviously with the same-sex marriage postal survey, uh, I was hopeful that we would see a positive result. You know, I was hoping that, you know, that there, there's still enough sense in the Australian popula population because uh, we've sort of held the line for so long and we haven't legalized same-sex marriage. I was hoping that there's still a large conservative base there. As I was speaking to a lot of conservative people at the marches we went to, um, they were not very hopeful. They were saying that, you know, it, the, the polls were probably accurate, but they thought it would be closer than it was. And I think they, they, they found out at the end that it was because, you know, a lot of the polls were saying, what, 70, 30 percent, 80, 20 percent. And then when the result came out, it was 60 um, and uh, what, 60 and 40. So I think it was a lot higher than they originally hoped. I think it was interesting that Blacksland and Watson. So if you guys don't know, we are in the Watson electorate. This, this is the Watson electorate. Uh, that, that this church building is in, and same with Roselands. Blacksland is the, the electorate to the west, right? So that's Bankstown and Condal Park, that area. Blacksland was the, the suburb, or the electorate, not suburb, right? So they didn't do it by... The reason why they do it by electorates is because that's how the, the country is divided by the members of parliament, right? So in the lower house, you have uh, a representative in each electorate, and in the electorate that you sit in, there's a member of parliament that represents that electorate. And then they're the 50 House of uh, members of parliament that sit in the lower house. And then you've got senators that represent in each state. So that's why when it comes to voting and things on a, f a federal level, they, they do it by electorate because you don't really vote by, um, by suburb, right? That's, uh, you get to the local council cities and whatnot. So Blacksland, Blacksland was 73%, right? 73% no. And, uh, and Watson was 70% no, but there was only like 12 or 13 electorates that registered like a majority no. Um, if you looked at the results, I posted them in Facebook, uh, that uh, New South Wales actually had the highest no vote. It was 42 uh, to, to 58. So I don't know, I, you know maybe because there, there's a church here that's been praying. You know, maybe there's a church here that's been preaching the gospel. Maybe that's been making a difference. A lot of people were saying that it was the Muslims, right? The Muslims voting against same-sex marriage. But the Muslim, that, you know, even though, you know, we live here, right, and we see a lot of Muslims, there's not actually that many when you actually look at the population. There's only actually like 30% Muslims. It's just the reason why it feels like there's a lot of Muslims because they congregate, they live close together, like Punchbowl, the Kemba. And if you live there, you see them because they're very visible, right? You can see the ladies, you can see the men in their robes. So that's why it just feels like there's a lot. But I think if you actually counted them up, when you look at the statistics, there's not actually a majority uh, even in this, this electorate, probably just in certain pockets within the suburbs. And one thing I was uh, sort of listening to and reading up 
is people were saying that uh, there are these immigrant communities, right? There's uh, like the Filipinos, the Chinese, the, 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 the Lebanese, the Arabic people, and, and the Muslims, right? They're all the ones that are voting against same-sex marriage. And um, yeah, that's probably true, right? Because, you know, these communities, they probably haven't been deceived, you know, like, like the Westerners have, into thinking that this stuff is normal, like this transgender ideology is, is, is normal when it's not. So one thing they were, you know, one thing they were saying, and I'm kind of just giving you a news update here, but one thing they were saying, they were saying that, you know, these immigrant communities, they, 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 they're trying to crack down now on immigration policy because they're saying like, oh, these immigrants, these intolerant immigrants are just migrating here uh, and then they, they don't have any tolerance, right? And Labor's finding themselves in a bit of a bind now because they're always for protecting the, these ethnic minorities, right? But now all the ethnic minorities don't actually support same-sex marriage because all, all the electorates, did you, I don't know if you know this, all the electorates that voted no all have Labor member of parliaments, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting thing, but this idea that migrants are migrating with intolerance doesn't even make sense, right? Because what's the law of the land? The law of the land is that that marriage is between one man and one woman. So why, why would they, how, how can they use this same-sex marriage debate to say that they migrated uh, with some sort of malice or anything when they, when they agreed with the laws of the land when they migrated here? When their parents migrated here, homosexuality was still against the law. It was only 20 years ago. 20 years ago in Tasmania, 1997, that was when homosexuality was decriminalized in Tasmania and the only reason why it was decriminalized is because they had pressure from the United Nations, right? Because they were trying to hold the fort. Every other state had decriminalized homosexuality and Tasmania was holding the fort until it was pressured by the United Nations and then, you know, all the homos were going at it, right? Till eventually they decriminalized it and many people can see this, you know, when you decriminalize homosexuality, you decriminalize adultery, this is the world that you now live in. You live in a world where it's just free for all and, you know, it's just another gender identity to be pansexual or polyamorous and, and all this, this crazy stuff. Um, I like something that, uh, I don't know whether it was the lady that was in the No campaign, but some activist mom, she said, you know, we have become so open-minded that our brains are falling out. You know, where people, they're just so concerned about offending people. They're so concerned about, oh, you know, uh, uh, what these different identities are. They just want to seem like open-minded and tolerant that they're not even thinking these th things through anymore. Um, it's absolutely crazy. So. You know, obviously, I'm disappointed. You know, I'm disappointed, obviously, with the country, you know, that they just didn't leave it as it is. But unfortunately, we live in a democracy. And, you know, obviously, I'm disappointed with the result of this postal survey. But, you know, at the same time, I'm not surprised at all. You know, I wasn't shocked that they won. You know, I, I think it would be a shock if the no vote won. I think that's what everyone was hoping for. They were hoping for a Brexit style, Trump style upset where it's like there's this silent majority and we'd find out the result and it was like, whoa, like 60% was actually no. Um, and it was just all the polls and everything that were just showing it at yes. But you know, I'm, I'm not really surprised that the homosexual agenda is winning because, you know, obviously you've got the gravitational pull of sin, right? Because you've got people, you know, they're, they're, you've, got, you've got straight people fornicating you got straight people committing adultery and straight people just, you know, having sex outside of marriage and whatnot. They're not, they're not going to stop somebody having sex with the same gender, right? Because they're already so perverted and, and fornicating themselves. They're saying, well, I sleep with so many women. Why can't this person sleep with a man? So that's the country that we live in. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised that these people are, are, are supporting uh, homosexuality. So you know, there's the gravitational pull of sin in the sense that, you know, we all have this sinful nature. Um, and not only, you know, I'm not surprised that they won just because of even the financial backing, right? They have all the financial backing and the marketing and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
And not only that, but think about it, right? The, the homosexual agenda, they have been at it for decades, right? They have been in, they've invested time, they've invested money, they have lobbied the government for decades and decades. They have permeated our culture in entertainment, in music, in movies, in games, in schools. It's all over the place. So why would I be surprised? They've been at it for a long time. And then, you know, and then add to that, right? Add to the fact that even Christians, right? People that go by the name Christian, they have contributed to the destruction of the family, right? When they have not upheld the values, they've not upheld the Bible, you know, they've used poor arguments to defend the faith. They don't know what they believe. You know, most Christians, you know, like we go soul winning. Most Christians don't know what they believe. Most churches don't preach doctrine, don't preach things, don't take the stands. And, you know, even, even Christians within our circle, you know, they're more excited about video games or movies or sports more than they are zealous about preaching the gospel. Um, you know, I mean, just think about it yourself. You know, we have a bit of a reflection. We can always blame the world, right? But you think, you know, how much did you read your Bible last week? Did you read your Bible much last week? You know, how, much did you how much time did you spend praying for our country? Right? We, look at, we look at preachers that aren't willing to, to say things. You know, they, they get an opportunity you know, to speak on TV and they don't take the stand. Like, you know, like Lyle Shelton's not even willing to say that he's against homosexuality. Right? And he's, and he's the Australian Christian lobby. And this is the problem. We've just like, we've just like kowtowed to, down to them for too long and then they just trample all over us and then we're surprised when we just are losing this battle. So, you know, when we're, we're silent, you know, they do all these things, we see something wrong, you know, we, we, we never raise our voices, do we? Uh, even, even myself, it's like, when was the last time we ever called our member of parliament, wrote a letter, you know, because we're too busy doing our own things. We're too busy with the world, right? We're too busy with the thorns. I'm not, I'm not really surprised. I'm just, I, 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 don't, I don't see how, honestly, Christians can be disappointed because we're partly to blame, right? We're partly to blame of why, why our country is the way it is because we're letting it go that way. Whereas, you know, we, we think about, you know, how much time, how much money do we invest in the work of God, understanding the issues, arguing the issues, but then you see the homosexual activists how much time do they spend doing it? How many weekends have they spent door knocking? How many times have they gone to Parliament? How many times? Like, it's just, it's incomparable, right? It'd be incomparable. So when I think about the result, obviously it's disappointing. You know, obviously, you know, we don't want it to happen. But at the same time, I'm not shocked because it's not that, it's not that homosexual marriage, right, is the first step. It's not like we're just opening this Pandora's box now. Pandora's box was already open decades ago, right? When we decriminalized homosexuality, when we destroyed the family, and now, because of all that, now homosexual marriage is being legalized. So it's just, it's just another step in this downfall. We've got to see it the right way. And unless we change what we're doing, unless Christians wake up and actually do something different, start taking serious the things of God, it's just going to keep going that way. Right? It's just going to keep going in that downward direction and maybe this is what we need right what we need is some persecution you know because when things are just going too smooth right we get too comfortable and the things of god take a back seat but when we actually start getting some persecution it's a little uncomfortable to to be a christian that forces you to wake up and realize hey we have to actually do something to change this country to change this culture and I think we can, we can hold the line, you know, if, if we're willing to do something different. We can't really complain about the decline of our society when we do nothing about it, right? Now, if we're doing all we can, right, if we're doing all we can and we're losing the battle, then, you know, that, that's as much as you can do, right? You know, you can't do anything more. But I think there's plenty more that we can do. So we, I think there's still... Um, the opportunity to change things, that's possible. Anyway, that's, that's my thoughts there, but uh, just to sort of, this is, this is what I'm preaching this sermon for. I'm just preaching on these different things because obviously uh, we're in the, we are in the minority, right? In this country. And, and not only that, I mean, we're in the minority of people that even hold to the view that, 
that marriage is between one man and one woman. And we're in the minority of uh, even the doctrines that we hold to, you know, even amongst the label Christians, the things that we believe and the things that we believe to be true, like salvation by grace alone, not of works, uh, we're in the minority too. So we are definitely in the minority. But what you, you want to be encouraged today to say, hey, you know, just because we're in the minority, that we're still in the right. We can still hold the line. You know, majority does not determine truth. Because what is truth? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the truth. That's how we determine truth. We don't determine truth by the majority. Just because a lot of people believe something, that doesn't mean they're right, right? That just means a lot of people are wrong. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, we don't determine our own truth. We don't get truth from the majority. Just because a lot of people believe something, that doesn't make it true. The reason why something is true is because the creator of this world, he tells us what's true. He is truth. He tells us what's true. We need to listen to him. We need to identify his word, and it's in the Bible. It's the Holy Scriptures, and that's why the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, this is the logical fallacy, right? When you look at all the different argumentations that people can have, there's all uh, people call them logical fallacies, right? Appeal to authority is one. You know, when people just believe, they say, oh, I'm right just because somebody who has authority has that position, right? And a lot of people will do that when they talk about preachers, right? They'll, they'll sort of justify themselves and they'll say, well, such and such did this. Or you might do, hopefully you don't do that with me, where you say, oh, you know, well, Victor does that or Victor believes that and you think that justifies your position. No, no, that's a logical fallacy. That means that you're just appealing to somebody's opinion as opposed to appealing to the truth. And, and appealing to people, right, or appealing to the majority, this, uh, this occurs in different ways, right? One is when people say, oh, you know, no one believes that. You know, sometimes you'll be talking to people and they'll say, oh, well, nobody believes that or hardly anybody believes that. That's a logical fallacy, right? Because it doesn't matter how many people believe something, that doesn't mean it's not true. Um, or they say, oh, how can so many people be wrong? Often Catholics and Orthodox have this mentality, right? Where they're just like, well, what makes you think you're right? You know, your church just comes out of nowhere, right? Which it doesn't, right? Because obviously it comes from somewhere. And, you know, and our foundation is in the Bible. But then they'll say like, oh, you know, can so many Orthodox or so many Catholics be wrong? Yes, they can be wrong, right? Because if they are not following the scriptures, if thy word is truth and they're not following the truth, then they are wrong. It doesn't matter how many people there are, how many people that believe it. And it often, it often it surprises me that a lot of Christians use this type of argumentation. If you find yourself using this sort of argumentation where you say you somehow appeal to a lot of people believing something and that somehow legitimizes your position, don't use those arguments. That's a logical fallacy. That's not, that doesn't make it right just because a lot of people believe it because it's so easy to uh, uh, you know, debunk that statement because you know, if there's a lot of people that believe the opposite. Does that mean that what you believe is no longer true? No. So it's surprising to me you know, when Christians also use this type of argumentation. And you guys might have experienced a lot where, you know, you're talking to the people, you know, maybe uh, in our circle it's about the pre-trib rapture, right? And they'll just say, oh, well, no, nobody believes the post-trib rapture. Nobody believes, uh, you know, that repentance is just a change of mind. It's just this minority, like, who are you guys? Well, that doesn't make, make it true or false, you know? That just means a lot of people might believe the wrong thing. And likewise, on the other side, you know, we're not just right because we're the minority either, right? So, it's, it's, so this appeal to the people, it, it works both ways, right? It's not just, well, you're right because a lot of people believe it. But some of the cults have this mentality, like Westboro Baptist Church, that's what they sort of ingrained into their people. It's, it's this them versus us mentality and, you know, we're always going to be in the minority. So because we're this minority, we're right as well. No, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're right just because you're always in the minority either. Uh, because a lot of cults are in the minorities, but that doesn't make them true. You know, ultimately what is true is the scriptures, right? We need to go to the Bible. Thy word is truth based on the person of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is truth, right? So his word is truth. And that's why we accept the scriptures as truth. So we just look at a couple of different passages in the Bible where 
the majority is often wrong. And I could go to a multitude of examples, but I just wanted to go to these three just to, to give you a few to think about. But in the Bible, the majority is often wrong. And the first one I've got here is that the majority are not even saved. Right? When we see in Matthew 7, it says here, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And look at this, and many there be which go in thereat. So there are many that are not saved. Right? Jesus was asked, are there, are there few that be saved? And then he went in into another passage, you know, enter in at the straight gate, right? Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So straight there, S-T-R-A-I-T, means narrow, right? Not straight as in not crooked. So straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So many there be which go in thereat. And you know, in my Christian life, I realize how few that few actually is, and how many that many actually is. Because, you know, when you grow up as a naive Christian and you just think anyone that calls themselves Christian is saved, you just think that there's a lot of people that are saved. You know, there's all these Christians in the world. But then when you realize what the gospel actually is, that it's salvation by grace through faith, that it's not of works, you realize that a lot of people believe in turning from your sins to be saved, that they can lose their salvation, that they have to give their life to Jesus to be saved, that they have to commit their life to Jesus, that they have to endure to the end to be saved. And I just remember growing up as a young Christian, you know, growing up, you know, as a young Christian, meaning I'd not been in the faith for a long time, just thinking, man, all the people I went to youth group with and all the people I went to church with, these people are all saved. And then when I realized what the gospel actually was, I re and I used to talk to my friends about them that I went to church with, I realized a lot of them didn't believe this, that they did believe in work salvation, that they believed if they didn't live right and they didn't endure to the end, that they wouldn't make it to heaven, right? And it's just so sad that, you know, that there are many, even amongst the few, you know, even amongst the minority of people that takes sense because the church that I went to it was a fundamental church you know they wore suits they were King James only they would preach like most independent fundamental churches would preach right where they would say oh you know the world is so wicked and you know we're taking the stand and we're trying to like hold the fort you know they were King James only but a lot of people weren't saved there as well because they believed if they didn't have the works they weren't sure they were going to heaven, right? They didn't know whether they would endure to the end. They hadn't repented of all their sins and they constantly struggled with assurance of salvation. And I just remember we would have many discussions in our youth group, um, just how to know that you're saved. And, and many, many young people are getting confused because they ask, how can I know I'm saved? And instead of just telling them, what's well, because you believe you know you're saved, they'll say, Things like, well, are your desires different? Has there been a change in your life? Just, you know, pointing people to their works and they just don't know because, yeah, they did have a change, but then now they're struggling, right? Now they're back to their old ways. Maybe they tried to give up drinking and they're back to drinking again or they tried to give up smoking and they, they're going back to smoking or they, they went to church and then they find they're out of church now and they're struggling because they don't, want, they don't desire to go to church right so they're saying like have your desires changed and they're like my desires haven't changed because i still desire the same things am i saved even though they believed on jesus christ so a lot of people are getting confused about these things and it's just unfortunate um because it just removes their uh what's the moves their uh what's the word their effectiveness to 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 do things for jesus Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So these people, you know, like I, I've heard many people say, oh, we'll keep reading, you know, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, don't let anyone use this verse to scare you out of your salvation, right? Like, you know, you're sure of your salvation because you believe on Jesus Christ. You ought to be sure, right? That's why the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. God wants you to have assurance. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to know that you're saved. You ought to be pleased at the fact that, hey, I can know that I'm saved. But people will go to this passage and say, oh, you know, well, even the most dedicated Christians and whatnot, 
you know, will not, may not be saved. Yeah, but Jesus says, I never knew you. It's not that he used to know you. And look, these people are trusting their works. Have not we done many wonderful works? But you know what surprises me at some Christians is that they don't judge people's salvation by what they actually believe about salvation is that they'll look at somebody and they say, but this, but this person on YouTube or whatever, you know, in this church, but they're so dedicated. You know, they're so, you know, I mean, if you were to compare me to them even, you know, these people are so sober, they're so pristine, they've got it all together. You know, they're, they, they're even more zealous than us. They do a lot of work, right? But that describes these people exactly. So to me, it's, why, why would I... Why would I say, hey, this person must be saved based on their works, based on the fact they testify of Jesus Christ, when in Matthew 7, Jesus himself says, hey, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, right? So these people are the ones saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. Like, he's, the, he's the Lord of the universe. He's, the, he's worthy of all our praise. And they're teaching in Jesus' name, right? They're prophesying in Jesus' name. They're casting out, they're doing miracles in Jesus' name. They've done many wonderful works in his name. Right? But then, you know, these people aren't saved because they don't believe uh, on Jesus Christ. They don't, they're trusting their works to get them to heaven rather than uh, Jesus Christ alone. So, you know, the majority is wrong here, right? The majority are going to hell. Uh, it's the minority. It's the few that are saved. Uh, it's the few that Jesus knows uh, that believes on them. So, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's not a surprise when the majority is wrong. Look here, the majority crucified jesus now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner whomsoever they desired and there was one named barabbas which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with them, with him who had committed murder in the insurrection so i don't know if you know this about barabbas or if you've read mark 15 but Bar you know when you watch and this is the problem this is what i hate all these damn christian movies right they're just like portray the, you know like you know you you see uh um uh, like Judas, right? Judas is always like the dark-haired disciple. Like everyone else has blonde hair and brown hair, but, but Judas is like the dark-haired, dark-eyed disciple that's always like a little shifty. You know what I mean? And it's like, that's, that's not how Judas was. Like nobody knew Judas was going to betray Jesus. And it's the same with Barabbas. Like whenever I've seen like Jesus movies, Barabbas is always kind of like, he's got no teeth and everything. And he's just like this really derelict person that comes on. And obviously he was a murderer. But here in Mark 15, we learn about why he was a murderer. Isn't it interesting? It says there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him. Right? So an insurrection is when it's like, it's like, a, civil, it's like a civil disobedience, right? Like when the Jews would revolt, you know, maybe against the Romans. And he ended up killing somebody in that revolt. So he might have been like a political activist that took things too far and murdered somebody, right? And this is why they wanted him let go, right? Because he, I reckon it's because he, he was actually doing things, you know, he, he was actually going against the Romans at some time and whatnot. So he had committed murder in the insurrection. So I think that gives us a bit of insight into why also they chose him, right? They, 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 they wanted him. Because it's like, otherwise, why would you just want some random murderer, you know, let go um, if, he, if he's a murderer? But I think there's, a, there's more to the story. I, I'm not 100% sure. Does, you know, you do your own study as well. I'm just going from what I'm reading here. But I think there's more to the story of who Barabbas is other than what he is always depicted as in, in, in Christian movies. Uh, that's a little side note. And the multitude... So we see here the multitude, right? The majority of them crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them, right? So they wanted somebody released. But Pilate answered them saying, will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? So he's referring to Jesus. For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. So you see, even Pilate knew that Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. He also knew that the reason why that they were delivering Jesus to them was not because even they thought he had done anything wrong, but... They were delivering Jesus to him because they were envious of his, of, of his influence, right? And what he was, he was changing, he was, he was a threat to their power. Look here. Uh, but the chief priest, look at this, moved the people, right? And this is the problem with democracies. This is a problem with majority opinion and majority rule because the majority, the mob of people, the sheep mentality of people is so easily influenced by just an influential person. Right? But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. 
And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? Right? So Pilate now, he understands that Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And look at this. This is so sad. It says here, And so Pilate, willing to content the people. You know, these are not the sort of leaders we need. And this is a problem with democracy because these are the sort of leaders it creates because that's what democracy is, right? And this is why, the, you know, when you hear about this whole same-sex marriage plebiscite, right? And you see these electorates, you know, um, you know even though it's a Labour electorate, and they're going to vote yes, but even though an electorate voted no. And it's the same even with Tony Abbott. Like, Tony Abbott's electorate voted 75% yes, but he's still going to vote no, right? But they're, they're, they're the sort of leaders you want, right? You want the sort of leaders that are going to stand by their principles and actually vote the way they believe is right, rather than people that just say, well, you know what, I was elected to serve them, therefore, you know, I'm just going to vote whichever way that they say. That's the problem with democracy, right? That's why people like it. People like it because they want them to do their bidding. But the way the Bible has it is you have leaders that actually stand on principles, right? They stand up and do the right thing, and then they hope people follow suit. But it says here in Pilate, he willing to content the people. So just to make the people happy. He knew that Jesus had not done anything wrong. He knew that they had delivered to the, him, uh, him to them, uh, them he, he, that they had delivered Jesus to him for the wrong reasons. He knew that, that, that he had done nothing wrong. He's like, hey, why, what evil had he, has he done? But just to make the people happy, he sent somebody that he knew was innocent to death. He released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be, to be crucified. See, I don't even understand why they scourged Jesus. Like, what, 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 like why would they, even, they just do it to just content the people? They just wanted to show that Jesus was, you know, bruised and beaten, right? And obviously it fulfilled prophecy. But when you look, think about the mentality behind these people, they were so wicked. The last one I've got here, just the last example, is that the majority listened to the ten spies. So they returned from, from searching of the land after 40 days. So this is the story when just before they were going to enter into the promised land the first time, they sent in 12 spies, one from every tribe except Levi, right? Because Joseph is split into two. He had the double portion of inheritance. So that's where you get Ephraim and Manasseh. So they sent in a spy from each of those tribes and then one from the other 10 uh, tribes. Uh, Levi, I realized, didn't uh, send in a spy. So, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Right? So they went in there. If you read the beginning of the chapter, they went and spied out the land and they cut off um, so a cluster of grapes in the valley of Eshkol, right? That's where you get that song, you know, um, I want that mountain. I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eskel grow. I want that mountain. So that's referring to this story, right? This, uh, this, this promised land where they, it's the land flowing with milk and honey and the cluster of grapes they cut off in Eskel. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong, right? So this is where the doubt starts to creep in, right? The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, right? They've got big defences, and very great, right? That means they're very large, you know, these, these walls that they've set up. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Those are the giants, right? The giants, and, and not like this mythological giant where they're like, you know, 30 feet tall, 50 feet tall. Now, we know what the giants are in the Bible, right? Goliath was a giant, and he was like 9 or 10 feet tall. Just really large people, right? Children of Anak there, the, Am the Amalekites, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. What are they saying here? We're surrounded. Right? They're everywhere, right? They're all over the place. So not only are they bigger and stronger and more resourced than us, but they, they're all over the place, right? Numbers 1330. So now Caleb tries to take control, right? Caleb stilled the people. Right? Because obviously this doubt is trying to creep in. When, somebody's, when you're thinking about you're about to enter into a land and go to war, right? and somebody starts saying, oh man, but look at, our, look, at our, look at their influence. Look at their resources. 
you know, look at, look at, look at how many people support them. I mean, that's not the sort of speech that's going to encourage you, right? To, to actually go and fight a battle that you know God is with you on. So Caleb stills the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. So he's like, no, let's not hesitate, right? Because the more we dwell on this and we hesitate and we think about it, then we're going to not do it, right? You're going to hesitate and not go in. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it, right? Because if God be for us, who can be against us? Caleb knew, hey, if we're on God's side, if we fight, we will do some damage, right? They're going to go in and they're going to overcome it. But the men that went up, right? So this is the majority, right? These are the 10 spies because you, we know later that Jaleb, uh, Caleb, Jaleb, Caleb and Joshua were the two with Moses and Aaron that fell down and, and, uh, and tried to, uh, you know, um, change the people's mind. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. See, so it's not just that they're big, but it's like they're starting to lose heart, right? They see themselves as small now. And so we were in their sight. Chapter 14, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness. You know what they're saying here? They're saying, hey, they're being discouraged by these people that are saying, hey, you know what, uh, you know, you've already lost the battle. It reminds me of this whole homosexual debate, right? Where it's just like, yeah, they're all resourced up. They might have the majority now, but that doesn't mean we can't turn the tide. I mean, we can already see in a few electorates that there's still a majority. I mean, 73%, that's a pretty big majority, right? That's, not, that's higher than even the vote, right? So the, the majority in Australia was 61, uh, 61, 39, whatever, or 62, 38, whatever. But there are some electorates where the majority is still 70%. There's 73% of people that still realize that homosexuality is wrong. And if we don't do anything about it, that number is going to keep decreasing. But if we do something about it, then it can keep increasing. And maybe we can convert and convince some other people to understand what the problem is. And I think especially as we see the consequences of this playing out. We already see, I don't know if you're watching the news or you're seeing this on Facebook and YouTube. I mean, they're already talking about trashing you know, all the freedoms that we have. Because, you know, remember, remember before the debate when the homosexuals and Alex Greenwich and Roz Ward and uh, I can't remember, Tony Abbott's sister, that lesbian, right? She, they're all saying, oh, what are you so scared about? What's all the problem? You know, you're still going to be out of, nothing's going to change. We're just going to let them marry. And then as soon as the results come out, right, you have Corey Bernardi having an interview with Alex Greenwich and Carl Stefanich saying, you, you actually want to keep your freedoms? You actually want to be able to deny services to gay couples and homosexual couples? Hey, at least Corey Bernardi, I mean, I, I, I like the fact, I, I, you know, he's obviously, uh, he's not of, of our yoke. I don't know whether he's saved or not, but I think he's like a Catholic or something like that. But at least he had the guts to say, well, that's why this campaign was disingenuous. They were saying all along that it's not going to have any consequences, that it's not going to affect everything. And the day that the result comes out, they're already talking about trying to pass bills that basically take away the freedom to practice your religion, right? And it's only for certain clergy that they're allowed to discriminate, but nobody else is allowed to. So um, we're going to see those consequences happen. And I think as, as, as time goes on, people are going to realize and um, I think we can definitely change it. But here, what they're saying here in Numbers 14 is they're basically saying it would be better, they're, they're basically saying it's better that we did nothing, right? So they've, they've come out of bondage, they've come out of slavery, right? And now they're scared of going into the promised land, they're scared of the fight that might await them. And they're basically saying, hey, it was just better that we did nothing, that we just didn't stir the pot. Like, why, 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 like, why do you have to say these things? Why do you have to like, get people upset? Why can't we just all get along and just be peaceful? Let's just, let's just find 
you know, what we have in common. You know, we just have, well, let's just find what we have in common and live in peace. But we've been doing that for 30 years and this is where it's got us, right? Where it's got us is they've just overtaken us because that's not how you win a battle. You don't win a battle by just like seeking peace when they don't want peace, you know, because when we speak, they're for war. They, they, they're not going to be happy. You know, they're like Haman, you know, they're, they're not happy that, you know, that we just want to get along. They want us to accept what they're doing and until we do they're not going to stop that's why even to them they're saying that this vote is just the beginning of a long road right and if you think this vote has just happened and that we should just die over and just give up then it's just going to get worse and worse and worse because they're not going to stop they're not stopping the fight and if you stop the fight if we stop the fight it's just going to get worse and worse they're saying here it's better that we did nothing better that we didn't fight at all. It's better that we just went back to Egypt in bondage and just, you know, lived, you know, at least we had onions and leeks and whatnot. At least we had our Xbox, right? At least we had our, you know, our pleasures, you know, before then, um, as opposed to, you know, making it a bit hard, making life a bit hard for us. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. So again, this majority, this democracy, right? Because God had appointed leaders over the nation of Israel. And they're saying now, hey, we're going to vote in somebody else to do what we want, right? And that's the problem with democracies. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation. And I won't read the rest for the sake of time, but basically, you know, we have Joshua, Caleb, Moses and Aaron basically, you know, uh, interceding you know, or uh, standing in the gap between God and them because God just wants to destroy them all now uh, because he's so angry with their mentality of thinking, you know, let's just not fight, you know, when we realize God is on our side. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So, you know, there are problems, obviously, with democracy. We see, we've seen a couple of examples here of the majority doing the wrong thing. And that's why, you know, I have always taught in this church, I haven't always believed this, right? Because when you grow up in Australia, you just think Australia is just this great country. You know, we're all, you know, Australians, all let us rejoice for we are young and free. But what freedoms do we have? We get, to, we get taxed like 47% on the highest thing. There's all, oh, all these different taxes. I mean, they're talking about raising the GST to 15% and all these sorts of things. Um, I really hope you know, as we, as we learn more and as we have more influence as Christians, that there will be more parties, you know, at least like the Australian Conservatives that will at least, you know, reduce taxes and at least preserve some of our freedoms. But I hope that we have more Bible-believing Christians, you know, involved uh, to, to, to stem the tide. But this is the problem with democracy. Democracy is not an ideal government system. And I think a lot of us have grown up taught that, hey, democracy is just this perfect government system and it just gives everyone a say. But that's the problem. The problem is when everyone has a say, you get these situations, right? You get these situations like in Numbers 13 and 14, everyone had a say and what did they want to do? They wanted to elect another captain against God's will and take them back into Egypt. They'd rather do nothing. So democracy is not ideal you know and that's this is why the bible the bible doesn't have a system of democracy when you see the system of government that god put in place it's not a system of democracy where the people can just vote and 51 percent of people can just change the laws of the land now the system of government that god has is that he sets the laws of the land so he gives the laws to moses right those are the laws of the land and then we have judges put in place. They don't decide what the laws are. They judge according to the laws. So they're given the laws and then they judge cases based on the laws that are unchanging, right? That are God's laws, right? So that's, that's the ideal scenario, right? That's why same-sex marriage should just never be a question because it just it should always be a sin for homosexuality and that shouldn't change. And then our laws should be based on the laws of God. Now, the pro there's problems with democracy. If you think about how democracy works, democracy is basically majority rule, right? So it's like the 51% is oppressing the 49%. And, and often if you, if you learn about different political systems, one way that they will describe democracy is it's uh, two wolves and a sheep uh, voting on what's for dinner, 
Right? That's kind of like democracy, right? Two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. But they say freedom is when the sheep, when that sheep has a gun. <laughs> that's, that's freedom, right? When the sheep has a gun, he can defend, he can protect his rights <laughs> against people that are violently trying to oppress him. And, and this is the reason why I don't believe in church voting. That's why we don't, you know, I'll take feedback from people, but ultimately I think decisions in church should be made by the elders so that, you know, decisions are made for the right reasons. Kind of like a judge, you know, we have our laws from the Bible and then we have judges set in place, which are like the bishops, you know, they're the, they're the judges and the, the overseers set in place and they judge according to God's laws. That's uh, similar to how uh, God has a government run in the Old Testament. Now, I don't know, this is sort of a side point, but uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about the advantages and disadvantages of compulsory voting versus voluntary voting. That's something that sort of came up in this whole debate because they're saying, well, you know, 80% of people participated in this, in this postal survey. And they're saying, I think Australia is ready. Oh, this is what they're saying, right? They're saying, and I, I agree with them, that, that Australia is ready for voluntary voting, meaning that people are not it's not compulsory for people to vote, meaning if you don't go and vote, you don't get fined. Now, your first thought might just be, well, we live in a democracy. Surely everyone should vote because then everyone gets their say and then it's fair. But um, just think about this, pros and cons, right? My view is I think voluntary voting is better. I get the, the pros of, of compulsory voting because obviously if you want to know what the majority think, everybody should have a view. But the reality of it is, is that most people are not really engaged in the political process, right? They don't really know what's going on. They don't know what the issues are. Like, you know, you go to the ballot and you're like, who, the, who even are these people, right? And then, and then you just like, you might just go like, oh, just one, two, yeah, I like that name, three, you know, or you just do like a, they call a donkey vote, right? Where you just go one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, and, and the reason why, that's why they have to randomize the ballot, right? Because if, if your name is like an A and you're always at the top, you get all the donkey voters. That's why a lot of people think, because if, if you just happen to draw a good straw and then you get at the top of the ballot, you get all the one votes because people just one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever, you know, they don't care. So, so the, 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 the theory behind voluntary voting, which is what a lot of other countries do, is that you don't get those idiots going out and voting. They just like, they don't even know an election. It's like, at least the people that are going to vote, they're the people that are engaged in the process. They know the issues. And then it's about, it's not just the marketing, but it's like, they have to actually get the people out to vote. They have to give them enough drive to say, hey, you actually have to go out, otherwise it's gonna make a difference to you. So then they go understanding the issues, right? And then they go vote. I know there are pros and cons. I know there are different views. I'm not really dogmatic on one or the other, but I can see the benefits of voluntary voting. Um, and, and they're saying Australia might be ready for it because, you know, did you know that, I don't know if you know this, but the US elections, they, because they have voluntary voting over there, right? They have a different system of how they count the votes, but only 60% of people actually participated in the presidential election. So Trump was voted in, but only 60% of eligible voters actually voted. So that's why they were surprised because a higher percentage of Australians were actually engaged in the same-sex marriage debate and 80% of them actually submitted their survey and it was voluntary. So it just goes to show Australia might be, is, you know, I think, because uh, even when they have compulsory voting, 10% of people don't vote anyway. You know, they don't attend, they get the fines or whatever. So it's not really that much different. Let's just end on this uh, last passage. Uh, just one more thought is, you know, what do we do now, right? So, and I've sort of been harking on it this whole sermon, that you just, you know, we just got to keep fighting, right? But I wanted to show you the example of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6, where we see, because likely the laws are going to change, right? Likely, you know, I think all the politicians committed to saying, hey, you know, whatever this same-sex marriage survey turns out to be, they're going to respect the will of the people. You know, some are going to vote no anyway. Um, some are going to abstain, you know, or whatnot, but, you know, there's, there's the majority there where people are going to, you know, pass whichever James Patterson's bill or, you know, whatever, whatever other bill. But look at what Daniel does, because I think this is a situation where the laws actually change, right? And we know the story of Daniel, but I just wanted to finish on this point. It pleased Darius, a King Darius, to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, right? So these are like his governors, right? Over his, king, over his kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, 
that the princes might give accounts unto them and the kings should have no damage. So you can imagine 120 people set throughout the land. Then there's three presidents that are given, I suppose, that look after 40 each. Daniel was number one of those three presidents. So you can see the influence you know, that he had in that culture, you know, in that, that play time back then. So he was a man of stature, right? He was a man that had a lot to lose, if you think about that, right? Think about like a CEO of a corporation or a, a governor, somebody that has a lot of influence, but they also have a lot to lose if they make the wrong step, right? If they upset the wrong people. Uh, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him as the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So almost Daniel was going to be probably leader of the three presidents to, to look after this realm, right? Because he was so faithful in what he did. This is the testimony we ought to have at work, guys. When we work for our bosses, they ought to think of us like this, that it's like, hey, you know, they can look, you can look after things, right? It's the same when I give you a job at church. Like, you ought to have this mentality, right? Because you're not serving me. Yes, I've asked you to do it, but you're serving Jesus, right? You want to have this mentality that, hey, Jesus looks at you and he's like, hey, I, I like the way he works. I'm thinking of setting him over the whole realm because that's what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom, right? How faithful you have been with little, right? Be thou over 10 cities, God says. So if you want to have a rule over many cities in the millennial kingdom, you better be faithful with the small things that God gives you. And the king thought to send him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Oh, well, what a testimony. But they could find none occasion nor fault. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure my boss looked hard enough she'd probably find occasion and fault, you know. I'm sure if you guys looked hard enough there'd be occasion and fault. But, you know, look at Daniel. This is a, he's a great, uh, great example in the Bible. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Right? Even when they're trying to find things, right? Because often, you know, people don't know you have any faults because they're not really looking that hard, right? But these princes, they want to find fault against Daniel. They're looking to try and where he's dropped the ball, you know, and something that he's done. And they're like, we can't even find something where he's dropped the ball. He just does everything so well. Uh, then said these men, these people that want to get him in trouble, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now that's how it ought to be with us, right? At work where it's, hey, there's no fault found with this person. This person's a great worker, a hard worker. The only way we're going to get him fired is if of his religion, right? What he actually believes, right? Maybe they try and corner you to say something or whatever. You know, that might happen in the future. You know, when same-sex marriage is legalized, you know, they know that you're a Bible-believing Christian. They might try and get you fired, right? Knowing that, oh, you know, now it's hate speech and whatnot. What are you going to do? You know, you're going to take a stand for God? Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So they're basically saying nobody can pray or ask anything from any other god, only to the king, and if they do, they're going to be thrown into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree, right? So in our vernacular, it would be make a law, right? And sign the writing that it not be, be not changed according to the law of the Medes and, Persia and Persians, which altereth not, which doesn't change. So once they set a law, it can't be changed. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. So the law is passed, right? It's passed through Parliament or the king here. Now look at this, right? Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so he didn't do this ignorantly, right? He knew that it was against the law. He knew that they had passed this law, making it illegal to pray to any other god. It says, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber, did he do it secretly? Did he do it privately? Was he worried about anyone knowing what he believed, what he was going to do? No. And his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. You know, unfortunately for some Christians, they only get zealous when it's illegal now, right? Now they want to, you know, it's illegal, but, you know, 
often that doesn't happen. You know, often when it's legal, if you're not doing it, when it's illegal, you're probably not going to be doing it. But we want to have this sort of testimony, right? Where, hey, we are already doing it, and when it becomes illegal, we're just going to keep doing it, right? Just keep on keeping on. So what do we do now, right? We just do more of the same. Nothing's changed for us, you know, unless you're not really doing that much. If you're not really doing that much, then you ought to be doing more. That's what we got to do now. We got to do more, do more, keep doing what we've always done, right? Which is preach the Bible, preach the gospel, keep fighting the good fight of faith. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. So now it's going to be out of season, isn't it? Even more so. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Right? So we ought to be diligent in what's happening. We're going to go through some trials and we keep preaching the gospel. We do the work of an evangelist and that way we're going to make full proof of this ministry. So that's just my closing thought. I think some persecution will do us well because I think we've, we've been comfortable for too long. Right? We've been comfortable for way too long. I think a bit of persecution will get us moving. But I just wanted to show you here that, hey, it doesn't matter if we're in the minority. We should just keep doing what we're doing take a stand. I hope we can take the example of Daniel and see that, hey, even if it does become illegal, I hope you guys will have the boldness. I hope I'll have the boldness. Well, we have the boldness to just do what's right regardless of the consequences, you know, and, and take that stand that we need to take. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, uh, for um, the grace that you give us. Uh, Lord, we might be coming into very hard times soon. I pray, Lord, that uh, you'd give us boldness and grace. Lord, Daniel had a lot to lose. He was a man of high stature, but Lord, he, 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 he counted that all for naught, like Paul did. He counted it but dung, that he may win Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we would have that mentality, Lord, that we would stick together, that, that persecution would bind us together. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would take the stand. And uh, Lord, if we come across any ill will, that Lord, uh, it would be a chance for us to love one another and take care of one another. Uh, in that climate. So I pray, Lord, that you give us boldness, give us wisdom as we continue to fight the good fight of faith. I pray, Lord, for those that are in authority, that, that they would allow us to live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And pray, Lord, that those that do have authority in this world, that, Lord, that they would uh, fear you and that they would take the right stands and, Lord, prevent at least this country or at least this state from going down the proverbial toilet. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that, it, uh, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us to follow in your footsteps. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.